Hello and welcome to the 39th episode of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Today's episode, sponsored by Never Ending Pain. Daily supplement that you can take that, well, will cause you pain. It's delivered to you directly. Physically, emotionally, spiritually painful. Which is... We've been taking it for years at this point. Well, yeah, it's delivered it's, to you directly. You don't. Uh, it's compulsory. It's compulsory. <laughs> uh, you don't have to pay for it, and um, you know, there's uh, no end in sight. Wow. Yeah. Um, you can get it for six easy payments of uh, sixty six sixty nine uh, nice. yearly, and you just you pop that bitch up daily, take it down, and uh, you're just constantly in misery. Yeah. I've been using this product for years, and I can't recommend it enough. Yes. Uh, congratulations to uh, to Never Ending Pain Pills for the first ever official sponsor of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. Um, speaking of pain. Yes. Never ending un- un- physical pain. We've both been doing very physical things. Yes. You much more than I. <laughs> I got sunburned because of it. Yeah. yeah. Sam, Sam was at a, a Tough Mudder event this weekend because yeah. he's a psychopath. Yeah, and Connor's been lifting heavy. Yes, I've been I've been taking taking metal that is that that has s- significant weight to it, lifting it repeatedly, and then setting it back down mm-hmm. uh, multiple times. And I'm paying the consequences for that right now. My leg hurts. My right calf hurts. Everything else is actually kind of fine. That's but interesting. I don't know why. I, I, I'm right footed. Maybe maybe you're stepping too hard. I mean, I've, I've been doing squats every day. I want to get my knee stronger because I want to ski in the winter. I used to ski all the time, and I don't anymore because I have weak 90-year-old man knees. Yes. So soon you might have strong 78-year-old man knees. That would be nice. That would indeed be nice. But this isn't a fitness podcast, nor do I think we should ever do a fitness podcast. No. We, no. we are casual fitness people. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slightly above casual, and you are a slightly below casual at this time. I'm not saying, I'm saying I'm casual. I'd say I'm at You're casual. You're at casual? At casual fitness. Simply, like, I don't want to brag. Six months, I've lost 50 pounds. Was most, uh, no, 18 months. There we go. 18 months, I've lost 50 pounds. Over, actually, 55. Five, the last five were in the last six months. So it's, it, it plateaued, which is why we're working out. But but this is not a fitness podcast. This no. is, in fact, it a is, D&D. It is ostensibly a Dungeons & Dragons podcast. It's been a while. And uh, now, also, a- Magic the Gathering. That's yeah. true. That's true. That's true. We've, we've, ex- we've broadened the horizons, for sure. We may need to broaden them ho- more with, uh, with as, as news of keeps coming out of Wizards of the Coast and things they do. Yeah. I don't want to talk about toys. I don't want to talk about... I really don't want to talk about their partnerships with, like, League of Legends, because I'm not a fucking dork. Mm. I'm a dweeb. I'm not a... Well, do I want to be a dork or do I, Is it worse to be a dork or a dweeb? I don't know. Is, you don't, is you it don't a have dork a whale penis? I'd rather be that. You'd rather be a whale penis? I mean... Yeah. What are we talking about? Well, what? Okay. <laughs> we got the D and D movie. Yeah, it's been out for several weeks now. Overwhelming commercial success. Um, there's, there's, they've admitted that it has made a ton more money than they thought it would. It, the critical reception, the tomato meter on Rotten Tomatoes is ninety percent overall, including the critics. Audience score of like ninety four. So mm-hmm. highly recommend. Go check it out. I also saw. I can't remember who did this or what market pl- or what three D printing mar- marketplace it was on. They had the. Um, the popcorn buckets that were massive, like D20s, yeah. like the commemorative ones that you could buy, and they were a little expensive. But someone has uh, replicated it in 3D to scale, uh, and you can get it to print on a 3D printer, there which is go. pretty cool. And it's got, like, embedded magnets, so it's, like, cooler and stuff. Highly recommend that. Also, uh, we are going to be discussing the leaks of uh, the March of the Machine Aftermath set. There have been some... Basically, the entire set has been leaked. Mm -hmm. Uh, We will not be talking about any of the cards included in the leak, so you don't have to worry about spoilers for that. We will be talking about the leak itself and the situation surrounding that. It's a very strange situation, but we'll get into that. Not entirely surprising. Wizards of the Coast, like, I feel like they purposefully leak shit half the time. This one doesn't seem an intentional leak. Yeah. But they do seem to purposefully leak things all the time. Um, I feel like we waffled on 
enough. Well, let's pancake let's... ahead. Oh, pancake. Pancakes. Do you know one of the great pancake memes? One of my beloved Persona 5, the pancake meme mm. with the catchy. Sure. And he, heard, he heard them talking about delicious pancakes and that unraveled everything. <laughs> Spoilers for Persona 5. <laughs> if you haven't played that game that's been out for how many years now? Uh, six the royal update was like three years ago and now it's on like every platform so play persona persona games are good <laughs> i would love to do a persona podcast there's not enough to talk about with a to do a persona podcast unless it was like monthly but i would love to talk about persona constantly it's one of my favorite game series it's good up there with kingdom hearts and yeah if you're into turn-based rpgs it is like grown-up pokemon <laughs> I mean, it really is. is. Yeah. It really is grown yeah. up Pokemon. It's very good. Um, let's talk about some upcoming releases. As we do, we rehash this every single week just so you can stay abreast of the situations. Any changes? Uh, no changes for the D&D book releases. Upcoming, Bigby presents the Glory of the Giants, quarter three, 2023. A little bit of a delay. The Fandelver campaign, quarter three, 2023. A little bit of a delay. The Book of Many Things, quarter four, 2023. A little bit of a delay. And Planescape, a little bit of a delay. Also quarter four, 2023. Why they are releasing all of these books uh, leading into the one D&D release who knows i don't know campaign book setting book fine that's very easy to adapt to a new one D D update but like we don't need a book of many things and we don't really need big b present glory of the giants personally. not yet anyway. not yet a post one D D release for those sure. i think it'll be fine uh for magic the gathering march of the machine is out right now uh we did our pre-release pack openings um on on TikTok Live, as we are often known to do, opened up a whole bunch of draft booster box or draft booster packs, as well as some set boosters. Because our local game store, we love them. The Comic Book World in Kentucky, Florence, mm-hmm. Kentucky. They, when you buy a pre-release kit, they also give you some uh, set boosters as well. It's a little bonus. A little bonus. Highly recommend. Highly recommend if you're in the area. Uh, so that is out now. The uh, March of the Machine Aftermath has been leaked, but that will be releasing on May twelfth. Very close yeah. already. Less than three weeks away. Yeah. The the set that I will be losing all of my money to, uh, the Lord of the Rings set, is going to be released June 23rd with an update to the set released on November 3rd. That's not normal, but they want more of my money. <laughs> totally fine. Commander Masters, August 4th. Uh, Wilds of Eldraine will be in September. And the Lost Caverns of Ixalan in November. Those are the those are the updates. So we're gonna jump into the news, the big one of the day. As of the release of this, this playtest will probably already be out. But as of the recording of this, the day before on April twenty fifth, uh, we do not have the playtest in our hands yet. But there is going to be a new one D and D playtest that is going to include five classes, fifty pages of classes, feats, spells. And the biggest one that they've been highlighting is the weapon update. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're going to include weapon masteries. Uh, The weapon masteries, if you you want to watch the video, you can do that. It's only 13 minutes long. And uh, Todd Kendrick and uh, Chris Perkins, they talk about the... They talk about some of the updates that are included. But Weapon Masteries are going to be a new system that's added to all of the martial weapons in 1D&D. Uh, they're going to... We, we alluded to it when they when we talked about uh, last podcast, mm-hmm. the... Uh, the weapons com- table. The weapons table with the community summit that they had. Yes. Um, so we get a little bit more of... De- we're going to be getting more details on what those are. We know, we know that slow is going to be a weapon mastery that when you hit, it's going to reduce the speed of the hit creature. Cleave, uh, you'll be able to cut through uh, an enemy and then deal damage to a creature within five feet of it as you cleave through them. Uh, there's also Vex and uh, some other... Nick, uh, several other... Sap. Um, yes. Um, puncture. Uh, all, of, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the details of which we don't know right now because it's not out and they choose to release these one D&D playtests the day we release the podcast. Usually like 30 minutes before the podcast actually posts. So wizards, we know what you're doing. Stop it. Get some help. Uh, that being said, we also know that certain warrior class uh, 
war- the warrior category of mm-hmm. classes, the fighter, the barbarian, the monk, are going to have the ability to access weapon masteries right out of the gate. And they said that the fighter, they want to be like the ultimate user of the weapon mastery. Sam, what do you think of some of these weapon mastery uh, abilities that we have so far? I think that, so obviously for a long time, we've had the issue of the linear fighter with the exponential wizard, Mm -hmm. um, where the fighter just gets, uh, is constantly getting good, but the wizard, like, woo, they're suddenly a god. Yeah, once you hit level five with a full spellcaster, it's it's out Out the door. Yeah, it's out the door. Um, The addition of all these masteries and uh, uh, the warrior group's access to them is definitely going to help with that some just by the fact that without a magic weapon in 5e Mm -hmm. you know uh the you know the the fighter hitting somebody with a sword is cool you did damage but it's not cool you help the fight along yeah um but overall these these masteries you know we've heard a little bit of oh they'll be able to uh change them out or add additional ones or choose eventually um it's almost just like a little mini magic system in and of itself on top of the weapon. It is. It is. And limiting the classes that it's available to, some people aren't going to like. Uh, mm-hmm. You will be able to take a feat that I believe we'll know for sure once it's released. Uh, we want to do a podcast talking about that. Uh, maybe a bonus podcast. We don't know. It might be on the next episode. Or it might be a bonus. We'll know. We'll, we'll, find, we'll figure that out as we go. We'll find out when it's posted. <laughs> what we end up doing. But... Um, it it seems like the fact that these are going to happen on every hit uh, and you can choose whether or not to activate it is going to be very helpful for marshals with boosting their power, um, at least with battle tactics. I don't know. None of them really seem like they're going to do extra damage yeah. per se. And I think that's good. I think if uh, wizards, even in, in whether they're cre- whether they're looking to build um, D and D stuff content mm-hmm. or Magic the Gathering, they always want to stray away from this is the choice. Yeah, you know, this is the number one thing you have to do. And while a lot of people tend towards those things when, uh, for example, min-maxing or optimizing a class or a, a deck in MTG, mm-hmm. uh, the the giving just a straight, here's how you can always get more damage, that's that's an always take, yeah. you know? Even, you know, whether whether Absolutely. you're you're building a a thing that hits a lot or a thing that hits once and big. Yeah, that that's why people were very upset by the changes to the Great, great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter feats. Uh, from previous uh, 1D&D playtests because they removed the ability to take a minus 5 penalty to hit to Mm -hmm. deal plus 10 damage, which I'm a very big fan of those feats as they are in 5th edition. And I'm kind of... I hope that they have new power attack kind of feats where you can take a penalty to hit to deal more damage. Um, Some other details that we can infer from both the video and looking at the weapon tables that we have. Uh, Slow is reducing speed on a hit. Um, We have flex, which is applied to weapons that have the versatile property. Versatile being if you attack with one hand, it deals the regular damage. If you attack with two hands, it deals an increased die size in damage. Flex, if you're able to use it, you can deal the higher die size damage with only one hand. So for example, with the long sword, it is 1d8 slashing with a versatile for 1d10 if you use both hands. If you're able to use the flex mastery with it, you can still deal 1d10 damage with one hand and then have a shield in the other hand or a spell casting focus or whatever else in that other hand um graze is seemingly applied to weapons that have two damage dice for example the great sword deals 2d6 slashing damage and the graze property if you miss with an attack and with it, if it's within a certain range is what i would bet mm-hmm. if you miss with an attack you'll deal 1d6 instead of 2d6 damage uh cleave is applied to the larger damage size the larger damage dice sizes like the glaive and the great axe that are two-handed and when you hit one creature you can slash through and deal more damage to an additional creature within five feet of it um those are really the only ones that we know for sure we can infer that topple is going to be knocking someone Um, prone uh push pushing them away from you that kind of or moving them mm -hmm. around the battlefield um chris perkins 
was it Chris? Oh my gosh. I hope, I hope I'm not totally butchering that. It was Chris Perkins. No, Jeremy, Jeremy Crawford. Crawford. Chris Perkins was talking about D&D villains. Jeremy Crawford has been play testing. They've been doing internal play tests with one D&D all the time, as you can assume. And he says he's been playing the fighter. Um, that's going to, it, the improved battle tactics with the weapon mastery is being able to move creatures, deal extra, mm-hmm. deal damage across multiple creatures, augment fighting has been like the most fun he has had with a fighter. Uh, the fighter has some very interesting features that make it, they want to make the fighter like the ultimate user of weapon masteries in a way, uh, at getting access presumably to all of them mm-hmm. very early on. Being able to change what weapon mastery is on a weapon, and then later being able to apply two weapon masteries to a weapon and then pick which one triggers on a hit. I think this is a one, a very good, at least this this preliminary high level view is a very good flavor win, mm-hmm. making uh, things like the fighter actually feel, you know, reasonable uh, or like more interesting to play, and to giving each weapon a different. Uh, a different feel because you know before in 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 2014 5e you know uh, okay cool you used a uh, a club or you used a dagger okay did you do bludgeoning or piercing damage now they have some other properties to go with them Mm -hmm. and that might make uh, a non-fighter a non-warrior class character or player choose them differently and, act, and and maybe even slightly makes uh, the weapon expert feat as presented um, reasonable to take at a certain point. You know? Yeah. Uh, we don't know what level, because they now apply level requirements to a lot of feats, mainly level four and level one. Level mm-hmm. one feats being able to be taken with backgrounds. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if weapon mastery was a level four feat, though it, it would be really, I think it'd be cool to have it at level as a level one feat, uh, particularly for like... Uh, the warlock with the hex blade and pack to the blade or uh, the wizard with the blade singer and that kind of stuff. But then again, because everything's being standardized, we're all getting subclasses at level three. So they might be level four feet. So it's like you get the ability to use a, like m- more efficient at using a weapon and then you're able to access the weapon mm-hmm. masteries is probably the route that they're going to go. Um, I'm very excited to try these out and get the specifics of what they all do. Mm-hmm. Um, they they alluded that other the other warrior classes are going to get it the barbarian and the monk but because they have other things that augment their fighting styles and what they're doing uh they're basically going to just get access to them mm-hmm. right out of the gate um i'm kind of surprised that we don't have that for like we've already seen the paladin and the ranger yes. for example uh, i understand not including it with the cleric a lot of people do a very heavy heavily martial cleric but not having that available to a full spellcaster right out of the gate i think is where it should be but with the ranger and the paladin specifically they do get access to spell casting but they're not spell casters per mm. se most of their spells are augmenting their physical abilities in the same way that like rage augments a, a barbarian and then key or i guess now it's spirit points because apparently they need to make it sound less asian or something you heard about that right yes yeah we discussed that that's, last podcast yeah that's that's dumb seems very unnecessary that's a whole that's a whole other discussion for another day but they're the spirit points for the monk being able to augment their physical abilities so in my mind the ranger and the paladin aren't really dissimilar to that it's just that they get their augmentations through spell casting and smite versus through rage and key point spirit points but in the same, if, if we want to go in that same light, then the spell casting this they have access to is a lot more flexible than, say, the rage. True. Um, True. And of course, we, again, we haven't seen these classes yet. And uh, talking about these things in isolation is always so difficult mm-hmm. um, because we're looking at individual things and even comparing it to the 2014 versions mm-hmm. uh, is, is, is like shooting, you know, yeah. shooting darts while you're drunk. Yeah. Very, very easy to do if you've ever done it, he said sarcastically. Yeah, there are totally not holes in bar walls that I've been to. <laughs> uh, the the last thing, uh, since again, we don't have this playtest in front of us because Wizards hates us personally. They're doing it to spite our podcast. Mm-hmm. I wholeheartedly believe that. Um, 
We also know that there's going to be five classes. Uh, it is going to be the fighter, the barbarian, the sorcerer, the warlock, and the wizard. Uh, monks are going to wait until a later playtest. Uh, so we're going to see what the warlocks get with Eldritch Blast. Mm-hmm. See if they're going to get any cool mastery things with the Pact of the Blade, which I think would be really cool. We're going to see what changes they've made to the wizard and the sorcerer with all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're going to include a lot of feats. They're going to include a lot of spells. Uh, they're going to include all of the rules glossary changes in their most current form. It seems like this playtest is going to be the first. Here you go. Take these with the class options that we've provided previously, and you can actually run and play proper 1D&D and playtest it mm-hmm. now, which is very, very exciting, and I would absolutely love to do. We, we wanna, we're we going to see if we can get some of our friends, some of our content creator buddies maybe, and try and playtest this out a little bit. Um, that being said... I've been seeing that we've got some comments in the TikTok chat. We're going to try and incorporate them more during the show as opposed to just at the end of the podcast. So do we have anything that's pertinent in the comments right now, Sam? Let me scroll through real quick. Doobie doobie doo. Sounds like a resounding no. <laughs> There's been some conversation in the chat, which is a little... Ed- that's nice. You can always you can always catch the podcast live on TikTok. Usually, we, we it seems like we're falling into the habit of doing it the Tuesday before the podcast is released, or the day before. Uh, every other Tuesday, we also do Match at the Gathering live streams every Monday night. I'm going to go ahead and say we don't have anything right now. <laughs> All right, well, Moving next... On. There's some plenty of questions, but they're more end, uh, end of episode, end of end, end Q&A, of Q&A, 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 Q&A questions. That's fair. Uh, next up, the other major bit of, uh, oh, well, I guess we should get into a little bit. Of, we'll stick with D&D for a moment. We're not gonna we're not gonna really get into this just because I'm so tired of all of the unnecessary constant drama for no good reason. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of kerfuffle around uh, the creator summit and people being upset by the removal of the half elf and the half orc because the original reason that they said is they 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 didn't want to give them special specialized stats because they didn't want it to how do I there's not a good way. They they bas- people are basically just calling them racist for getting rid of the half the half race feats features uh, and giving them special statistics. Um, the you can you can still have mixed race characters. You just have to pick one of the stats for mechanics purposes. You can be a half elf that's half human and half elf but you pick do you want the human stats or do you want the elf stats which by the way the reason they're really removing the half elf and the half orc in the first place they clarified this the existence of the half elf and the half orc imply that the only things that you can be half elf and with is human and they wanted to allow you to mix any of the races that you want together this uh, this is what D and D Beyond posted on their Twitter, which was options for creating characters descends from more than one species are not being removed from Dungeons and Dragons. Proposed adjustments to character origins have been open to the community since August twenty twenty two and will be revised further. Um, this is a a sensitive topic uh, to many people, um, and why they moved away from the the changing uh, the term to species, which again that's we- another discussion entirely i think moving away from races is totally fine except the name totally acceptable species just makes them sound like animals in my mind i would i would we've discussed we prefer like heritage or something Uh, or ancestry i think ancestries would probably be the way to go like an orc ancestry an elf ancestry that kind of stuff but um they're still you know so they are there are, are may, going to, always going to be many different opinions in the community, and this is a as a is a real wor- world kind of implication thing. Like they can do whatever to dragons, and people can get mad, but they don't have to care because dragons are you know they're fantasy, fantasy exclusively. Um, you know, a, a person's identity uh, and and a and how they that translates into 
this this game that's very real for a lot of people yeah um is difficult and so wizards is trying to listen to the community and um and and hopefully we'll see by the time um one D drops mm-hmm. a something that that more people can agree on than not yeah. you know I think I I still believe personally, and you don't have to agree with me. We we never have to agree on anything if we don't want. I still think that most of the of the outrage over the removing of the half elf and the half orc uh, was from people that didn't really fully know what they were talking about because they had already addressed it by the time people were outraged about it, and then they even went further in trying to quell the outrage after it happened. We already knew that they were removing the half elf and the half orc, and they even in the playtest that they originally released back in August, they specified if you want to be of a mixed uh, species, you can be. You just have to pick one of the stats as the stats for your character. So you can be an elf orc, you can be a dwarf halfling, you can be a human gnome, whatever combination of things that you want, you just have to pick one of the stats for the mechanics of the game. In essence, they made it more open than half elf and half orc because it was always, the half elf was half human, half elf, and that was it. And then it was half human, half orc, and that's it. Hmm. And you couldn't really feasibly mix any of the races together. And obviously people were doing that on their own already. Uh, One of the more famous examples, of course, being Jester from Campaign 2 of Critical Role being a mix of a water genasi and a tiefling. Mm -hmm. But now it's just mechanically you can do that and without making it super complicated by saying you get most of the stats from this, but you can get one ability and like trying to figure out how they can standardize that. It's like you just pick one of the stats to use and you can be a mix of that with whatever you want visually. And I think that's totally fine. But so as as Wizards has said, they're going to continue to um, listen, try to listen to the community and try to further revise their yeah. uh, to make Dungeons and Dragons to be more racially sensitive. All good. All good. All good. I think it's time we move on from D&D, seeing as we don't have the playtest in front of us and can't talk about it. Correct. In detail, which is a shame. Shame on you, Wizards. Release it earlier so that we can talk about it on the podcast. I'm like, why release it on a Wednesday? Release it on a Monday. Let people talk about it all week. Fair. You know? Yeah. Release it on a Friday. Let them talk about it over the weekend. That kind of stuff. Just, yeah. just Wednesday? Really? Okay. okay. We'll move on to Magic the Gathering. Uh, we have some information that we can share without spoiling uh, for March of the Machine Aftermath. We do know that uh, the set is going to be comprised of 50 new cards total. Only 50. A normal set is like upwards of 350 to 400 sometimes. Yeah. Uh, doesn't seem like it's going to it, it doesn't seem like it's going to include lands or any common rarity cards is going to be almost entirely comprised of uncommons, rares and mythic rares. Uh, each of the epilogue boosters, as they are calling it, is going to simply be five cards for the same price as a draft booster. But the cards are going to come in a combination of one to three cards of rare or mythic rare. And then two to four uncommons to fill out the five cards. And you are going to be guaranteed one to two cards of any of the rarities in traditional foil. So your best case scenario would be three mythics, two uncommons, and two of the mythics being foil. Worst case scenario, one rare, four uncommons, and one of the uncommons being foil. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you think that is worth it to you, you can decide. Uh, The... The booster box is going to include 24 boosters, 24 times 5 being 120. So chances are you're going to get all the cards in the set if you buy a booster box. Yeah. Um, You can also get a collector booster pack, which is going to include six cards instead of uh, four, or sorry, five, instead of five. And you're going to get one traditional foil double-sided token along with four cards of rare or mythic rare and then two uncommon cards. And then every pack is going to either be five foils or all six of them foils. Uh, There will be, oh, let's see. What? 12 packs per collector booster box. I thought it was four. The picture shows four, and then it says 12 packs per display, 24 displays per card. 
Wizards, get your shit together. Uh, it's. I would say, based on the picture, it's going to be four packs for a collector boosters box, which is the standard these days. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're going to have the same pricing, despite having much fewer cards in them. You can also get a bundle, which I don't know why you would do. It's going to include eight booster uh, traditional epilogue boosters. It's going to have a traditional foil alt art promo card, as well as a land pack of 20 foils and 20 non-foil lands. Spin down and spin down life counter and the box don't know why you would get a bundle in this situation unless you're just trying unless you just wanted eight packs yeah this is a weird set so wizards you know has said this is a this is a um a a, a lore based set that just tries to round out what has happened in the story of march of the machines um which the story of march of the machines of course you know has been um uh, has been brewing for all of uh, last year, starting in or, uh, uh, sets last year, and really coming to a point in Frexia All Will Be One, which was the, really the beginning of the, the arc, and then the end of, and middle of the arc were in March of the Machine. All at once. All at once. Which, the story itself was really cool. They just kind of skipped skipped all it. of the all yeah. of the building of it, you know? Yeah, so the question, you know, you gotta wonder why isn't this set, why didn't they just make this a full set, put it out, you know, a month and a half later than they're putting it out and uh, tell the end of the story where, okay, now the heroes are successful. But so this micro set, it's almost, I don't see any point in actually, you know, cracking these packs. Like they haven't, you know, in March of the Machine, you know, in in other sets, you have the chance of getting some really cool cards, uh, really rare, very powerful cards, and reprints that have been necessary. Like March of the Machine, you had the Ragavan reprints that uh, yeah. you could pull. This, wh- why, why would I be, I, you know, it's not fun. I don't find it fun to just crack five cards in a pack with, you know, the possibility of most of them being uncommons. Yeah, it... <sighs> It's one of the I Phyrexia All Will Be One, I think, was a very good set. And it was a very good opening arc of sparking the Phyrexian invasion, uh, and setting up like, oh fuck, this is a powerful faction. They Phyrexianized several very powerful planeswalkers, including Jace, which I was not expecting. You would imagine that in their standard three set block even though they've removed, they've gone away from doing blocks mm-hmm. of sets now, but Phyrexia all will be one was a great opening. March of the machine should have been in my mind, the Phyrexian invasion into the planes and the downfall of a lot of those planes. And then March of the machine aftermath should have been expanded into its own full set. That would have been the beginning, like the end of summer release. Mm-hmm. That is the remaining resistance uprising and taking out the Phyrexians and and stopping the invasion. A th- nice three-set arc, but March of the Machine, even in, in, the rele- in the announcement trailer for March of the Machine, you see Elspeth slaying Elish Norn. Yeah. Like, it's all this great buildup, and then in the first announcement trailer, you're like, oh, and it's done. Yeah. Before the set's even out, we know, oh, it's done and they've won. So it's like build up and immediate payoff without any any of the any of the like rising tension from a middle inter interstitial set. Which especially because it's especially frustrating because they felt the need to have an epilogue set to wrap up the rest of the story when they could have just chosen a different like split point for the story halfway through March of the Machine showing like, oh, everyone in like the entire Theros plane was like fucked up. Mm -hmm. Basically, they basically Phyrexianized all of the people so that the gods were no longer all powerful and indestructible and then be able to Phyrexianize the gods. Like you could show that you could show them taking over Ixalan. You could show them invading all of these things and fucking everyone up. And then the next set show the the uprising against the Phyrexians, the slaying of them, and the aftermath of that. But instead they choose to do this and then like shit out an extra like 50 card set that they're selling 
booster packs of five cards for the same price that they would for like what was it 12 10 uh they're same as draft boosters of so 15 so 15 and then collector boosters the reduced number as well for the same price it people already have set fatigue they're already people think they're already releasing too many products it felt like it, to me it feels like they wanted to just wrap up their story really quickly so they could just get out the lord of the rings set that they know is going to make them a massive amount of money. The Lord of the Rings set and the Commander Masters set, which yeah. already has ridiculous pre-sale prices on uh, your online retailers. Um, and they could have made, the if they really wanted to, they could have worked the uh, the, the March of the Machines um, aftermath, you know, the full set, the yeah. full end of the story into that Commander Masters. Like, oh, look, you know, because the Commander Masters is going to be a reprint of a lot of great... Um, cards for that are used in commander from Mm -hmm. all you know all of history well the yeah all these planes that are set that we've seen in command in uh march of the machine that could have been you could have pushed that all into there they need you could you could do new art for the cards and you could insinuate that like a lot of these staples are needing to like be re-put together after the end of the phyrexian invasion which would be like a cool thematic thing you could tie it in i don't think they would do that because they would they would want to keep Commander Master separate so they can make a lot of fucking money off of it. So, March of the Machine Aftermath. We might get some. I'm not particularly excited for it. No, Just I'm on print. I don't want to. I don't want to give them my money. Really. Yeah, I'm. I'm in that boat as well. Speak with your wallet. Uh, but this isn't the end of our discussion of March of the Machine Aftermath because the set has been leaked badly <laughs> by a YouTuber. Old school MTG. He posted a video of a box opening onto YouTube where he claims that he was sold the boxes by a friend who mistakenly thought they were collector boosters full of the March of the Machine set. They were actually collector booster boxes of the March of the Machine Aftermath set. Uh, old school MTG claims that he had 22 of those boxes total, but he only opened up one of them on camera, spoiling a large chunk of this 50 card mini set. It shows off around 75% of the total cards available, despite each pack only having six cards in them. Includes a lot of reprints, some brand new cards that were not formally revealed, uh, and he did pull multiple copies of two of wi- that of two cards that Wizards had already shown off, the Kenrith's Royal Funeral, as well as Joel, Joel Voice of Zalfir. Very few details have been released from Wizards of the Coast, but it included, we're not going to get into the details mm-hmm. of the cards that were shown in the video. The video has since been removed, and he also claims that Wizards of the Coast found him track him tracked him down confiscated the cards and the boxes and insisted that the video be removed uh he posted a video aptly titled the aftermath of the aftermath where he revealed that wizards of the coast had taken away all of the cards in his unboxing video and he narrated how it all went down you'd be shocked to learn that wizards of the coast allegedly sent the pinkertons to retrieve the cards from him yes the company that hunted arthur morgan in red redemption 2 <laughs> Oh, man, that's funny. Uh, He explained that his wife opened the door to some men who identified themselves as member of members of the Pinkerton Agency, a private security firm. They were allegedly there to confiscate the, quote, stolen Magic the Gathering cards. Having the agents of a security firm sent after you is undoubtedly intimidating, especially when they claim that you've stolen goods. He went on to explain that the cards weren't stolen, but they were sent to him by a friend who mistook them for collector boosters of the March of the Machine set. Regardlessly, he fully cooperated with the agents and handed over all of the cards. The Pinkerton then gave him the contact details of someone at Wizards of the Coast. Upon getting in touch with the Wizards of the Coast representative, was apparently very understanding. Unlike the Pinkertons, who jobs, whose job was to probably intimidate, the representative agreed that the cards were most likely not stolen, but sent by mistake. They needed to be retrieved, however, so that Wizards of the Coast could figure out where things went wrong. They also spoke about some sort of compensation for old school MTG. This entire situation is hilarious to me. It's it, it it is one of those things that is so 
immensely over the top that it's confusing that it actually happened. Like absolutely, the Pinkertons. A uh, uh, little background in the research I did just to make sure I was right. Uh, create uh, found in the nineteen or eighteen fifties, and of course are very known for um, uh, break as working as strike breakers and uh, and and hitmen for <laughs> unionize for union uh, leaders back in those days. Mm-hmm. Um, and have since changed into a private security and risk assessment firm. Uh, that being said, why would you send those? And I get it. Wizards of the Coast, you know, they have their own schedules. And, of course, they don't want their product getting out before they're ready. Mm-hmm. That's that's what a corporation wants. That's what That makes sense. And I think we can all kind of understand that part. Sending, though, a private security firm instead of why not just a lawyer? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why not just send a lawyer with paperwork and and a, and the same phone number to be to serve them? I mean, they serve cease and desists all over. Yeah, I think I I imagine that they recognize. First of all, the fact that these were able to get into old school MTG's hands, and he thought they were just regular March of the Machine collector boosters, means that. March of the Machine Aftermath was designed at the same time as March of the Machine. It was then probably separated from March of the Machine, packaged, printed, packaged, and seemingly sent off mm-hmm. early, way early, for this to be able to happen in the first place, which even lends more credence to the idea that maybe they should have just split the set in two, added a couple other cards, and done two completely different sets to complete the story properly. That's neither here nor there. The fact that this even happened at all, I think it was clear that it was something that it's something they've never really done before. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if Wizards was like, oh, this is this is a fuck up on our part. So we're just going to try and strong arm him to give us the stuff back and then we'll be nice on the back end rather than try and get lawyers involved and try to make a legal case and a cease and desist and all of that. Just because they wanted to get rid of the problem very quickly and figure out what went wrong yeah. without seeming like the bad guys. Well... Whoops on them. They definitely seem like the bad guys for sending a notorious, a, it, even, a bad, even a bad organization, a bad organization. <laughs> like even if the Pinkertons today were stand up people, which based on some other articles uh, of I've read, uh, probably not. No, um, <laughs> you still said a very notorious name. But that being said, what you got to wonder, like, you know, I was talking to some other friends about this and. What if the, what if old, old, the, what if the person they send them after was a was a more militant person, if you will, you know, more castle law kind yeah. of person? That could have gone very badly. Oh, very very badly. This, you know, as as again this ludicrous situation that it is, it kind of had the best outcome, which is old school MTG not getting hurt. Yeah, just having to give the product to them, take down the video, and might be getting compensated on the back end. Yeah. For the shitty reality that this is, that's kind of the best situation. Yeah. Again, so. But the fact that this happened at all, I, th- I think the real the real thing to take away from this, obviously, Wizards of the Coast is not going to want their products out in the hands of the people before the release. Mm-hmm. That's fine. That's fair. That's normal. Uh, game companies have to deal with this stuff all the time when they print things to discs and they get in the hands of people and they need to get rid of them mm-hmm. as quickly as possible before the release of a game. I think that's totally fine. Pinkertons, probably not the best <laughs> probably not the best group to pick to do that task. They can pick another group next time. But I don't blame Wizards of the Coast for wanting to collect their things. I think it is their fault to begin with. It is, absolutely. For clearly designing these cards at the same time as the regular set making the art very similar making the pricing is similar the pa- like everything basically the same except they reduced the number of cards in the fucking packs and then print them package them and be ready to send them out at the same time that march of the machines is being sent out so everything was probably ready at the same time yeah so they're just like yeah we'll just artificial which again We'll artificially delay the release of this so we can spread them out a little bit. Fine. But it's your fucking fault that this happened in the first place. Mm-hmm. So happy happy that everything's all right with old school MTG. I'm sure he got a lot of a lot of views and a lot of new subscribers. And I'm sure he'll be better off in the long run because of this situation. So good for him. Wrap up time. 
unless anybody in in the TikTok chat has anything to say. We're trying to we're trying to do this. We'll see if they're just regular conversation and more silly questions at the end. We're trying something new here on the Dungeon Bros podcast. Uh, so we've had a lucky cat, cat Oliver, <laughs> cat Oliver. There we go. Uh, you know, and some others are saying this. This is a, points a lot to Wizard's greed. Yeah. Um, Yeasty Nobody says make proxies, and Warforge says proxies would let players play, but stop that greed. Um, yes. I mean, we're big, pro- we're, we're big proponents of proxies. Big proponents of proxies, and I think more the as this as this saga of mm-hmm. wizards goes on, you know, over the past year, especially we've seen a lot more people becoming okay with the idea of proxies yeah. and come become okay with the idea of using the free resources online that are mm-hmm. available to us. You can use the free resources. Another thing you can do is if you already are opening a bunch of packs. Look through the art cards if you're getting set boosters, because mm-hmm. if you can find the art card that's the art of the card that you want to proxy, then you can just use that card as the proxy in and of itself, mm-hmm. which I think is the best way to do it if you're already opening set boosters. We were talking about this the other day. Um, yeah, proxies will work, but it's it, this a, this whole aftermath set, I think, is just so unnecessary to begin with. Yeah. And it's, it's a mess. Yeah, I really hope that... Wizards of the Coast looks at all the uh, the, the fuck ups that they've had over the past, well, specifically year. It's, yeah, it's been, it's been a, a rough, rough year. It's been a rough twelve months for for Watsi. Um, and hopefully can you know either reset their whole mindset or uh, you know eat the rich and and uh, and put new people on the board. Yeah. All right, we've got wrap up time wrap up first first item uh as an update to previous stories we have talked about uh bank of america and their financial and uh, business analysis of wizards of the coast more specifically hasbro uh they have released some some new analyses still claiming that magic the gathering remains quote a key risk for hasbro stock specifically because collectors are growing cautious of investing in the new set releases uh, the bank said that stores and collectors have grown more cautious of investing in new products, uh, new product sets of the game, specifically because people cannot be guaranteed that the value of the cards that they are investing in are going to maintain over an extended period of time, seeing as they are releasing so many sets so quickly. Uh, we, we've talked in the past about how clearly Hasbro has been flooding the market with new sets, diluting the value of the game itself, which is seemingly starting to have repercussions from people not buying as much and even stores not buying as much product to sell in the first place. Concerning. Mm-hmm. Not concerning? What do you think? Um, you know, with Wizards of the Coast and, and being part of Hasbro, they definitely have an entire division that's risk assessment. And they've got to have an entire division that's just market research and yet we still keep getting exactly what this article is saying, which is a flood of, of product that people have, you know, I think it said in the article, uh, wallet fatigue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody's, uh, everybody wants all, you know, we all want the products, but we don't need them now. Yeah. And we don't want to spend, I don't want to, you know, put out my money. I don't, I don't have the money, you, you know, to pay 120 to $180 for a set booster box every month. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, when I build a deck, I'm not going, I mean, we play commander. So a lot of the decks, you know, we build are, oh, look, here's all, you know, can I build these cards? Can I grab these cards from seven years ago, from 15 years ago, from 30 years ago that are still good today? I don't know about 30. 30? Well, yeah, Magic 30. Yeah. Yeah. Those cards will be expensive, though. <laughs> some of them are. There are still some and cheap crappy. But anyway, yeah. so it's like there are certain people who do need to, who do want to keep up and buy. But if you're playing you're, standard, if you play modern, you'll want newer cards. But doing that, but putting out so much new stuff, you're hurting those players. Mm-hmm. And you're not helping the players who don't want to buy those cards in the first place, who just want oh, yeah. to buy singles. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And not to mention the specialized sets that aren't even legal in the current standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, non-standard legal, non-modern legal, non-pioneer legal sets that are just there for people to collect to play in isolation or to for a commander or the few sets that it is legal in. So that's 
Wizards, calm the fuck down. Bank of America still thinks it's not good. There you go. Uh, next wrap up, we've got the nerdiest record ever in Utah. There was a group of more than a thousand. I believe the number was 1422, 1,422 people that were playing D&D at the same time, the same game. Nonetheless, they set up in a uh, mall in Utah, a whole bunch of tables that were looked looked to be around like five to seven players per table with a bunch of DMs. And the whole premise was an assault from a from a necromancer and their undead army against a city. And one table, like a couple tables would be like the fortifications on the wall and some of them would be on the streets of the city and some of them would be out in the fields and all this kind of stuff. And they were having a whole bunch of different combats happening for the same event at the same time which is awesome by the way Mm -hmm. and then oh shit this table failed so now the table adjacent to them is going to have a harder time because the things that killed them there are going to rush over whereas this table succeeded really quickly so they're going to send reinforcements over and help that table that's struggling and all that kind of stuff and it coalesced and coalesced and coalesced until like an eventual like all in damage roll where every single player rolled a d20 and they added all the damage together and i believe they dealt what was it 24,000 damage total to vecna who was trying to be to take over the city uh awesome broke the world record for most number of people playing D at the same time in the same game and we want to shout out one of our uh, personal friends the professor D&D, Professor D&D on TikTok. Uh, he's been on a bonus episode of the podcast to talk about him designing his own uh, his own third-party content and classes for D&D. Was at that event and participated. So congratulations on Super getting a world cool. record. Yeah. That's absolutely awesome. We need to immediately break that record at Gen Con now. <laughs> <laughs> we need to... Lit- I feel like they could do that in Lucas Oil Stadium. Oh, for sure. Easily. Set aside one of the days, like the, big- the biggest game of D&D ever, and break that record. Because screw you, Professor. We want the record, not you. <laughs> we love you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> we need it on this side of the Mississippi River. Exactly. Exactly. We need... We need Western United States, they don't need, they don't need a D&D record. No, they're, they're doing fine. Utah? No. No. Apparently there's still it malls in Utah. Really? Yeah, that's... that's so, holding it in a mall. Oh, man, that's old. <laughs> <laughs> it's very retro. Very stranger things. Very stranger. <laughs> very stranger things retro for sure. Wow. Uh, yeah, bring it Bring it to the east. Bring it to Indy. Let's get it done. Uh, the last wrap-up item. There's going to be a new board game that is uh, partnering Dungeons & Dragons and League of Legends. Or I guess they're simulating a League of Legends style gameplay because we're all the worst people, apparently. Uh, It's going to be called Dungeons & Dragons Trials of Tempest. It is a new board game where the base is going to be $99.99 and the premium version is $199.99. So it's going to be a very sizable board game. It's going to be for two to eight players where rival parties of heroic adventurers battle to prove their worth and meddle in the ever-changing battle realms of Tempest. Uh, the in the the board game is going to include nine map tile pieces, four D twenties, three hundred and forty four cards, three hundred and thirty three tokens, as well as twenty five plastic miniatures. The base set they're going to be unpainted. The premium set, all twenty five are going to be pre painted by Wizkids, and then it is going to include a rule book as well. Um, just looking at it monetarily, if you're not interested in playing the game, 25 miniatures, as well as 30, 333 tokens of varying amounts of usefulness for D&D or other tabletop RPGs for $100, unpainted. Not a terrible deal. No. Not a terrible deal at all. Like $4 a mini. And then $8 per mini if they are pre-painted, which I think is also a fairly decent deal. And if you want to give the, the game a try, if you like... Uh, if you like League of Legends, like a like a nerd, then you might be into that. I hope they have this at Gen Con, because I'd like to try it out, honestly. You know what this made me think of? Um, was something that we, you tried at Gen Con last year, uh, which would be uh, a D&D Onslaught. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit, but the, I, I just want to kind of step into that realm real, real quick and say, we were really excited about D&D Onslaught. Yeah, and just like a lot of things that Wizards, you know, D and D announcements, D and D announcements that Wizards made last year, they all kind of fell by the wayside. They just didn't really do much. Like it's out. 
Oh yeah, it's they, out. They it's just, available for purchase. They did expansion is out too. Yeah, they haven't. They haven't really. They haven't really advertised. They haven't really tried to push it. It seems like they had this great idea that they wanted to do, and they were most of the way through the development, and then they're just like, eh, whatever. We'll mm-hmm. just shit this product out. Yeah, the, I, the no I, fanfare, no excitement, no nothing. And the idea was that it would have these constant updates, these regular updates, so that it could be used. You know, it would st- it would remain uh, fresh for tournament and game and local game store play. But I haven't they, they, heard anybody. I don't think I don't think that's really even happening. Yeah, it's the thing. It it's frustrating because D D onslaught. I I play tested it at Gen Con. Uh, we we tried to show up because we weren't able to get tickets for it, and we were just going to see if we could slip in to like someone not showing up to the event, and only one was available. So I went, and then mm-hmm. Sam fucked off. I don't know what you did. I don't remember time. what I did. Uh, but we got you. Got, you got to take home a preview kit. It included mini pre-painted miniatures with it. Very nice pre-painted miniatures that we have and will use for D and D. It had a whole bunch of like the gameplay was fun. It it's too. I think it'd be more. It would have been more fun as like a four-player game where you had multiple because you controlled two characters each. Yeah. Uh, it seems like this you'll be able to control more characters, and it being a board game instead of a uh, like a wargaming kind of setup wargaming where it's a lot more open and freeform i think a board game with set rules and set scenarios and a more like you buy this box and now you have the game and can play the game and that's the game Mm -hmm. i think that's going to be a lot more appealing to people than a a new wargaming thing that doesn't really have a lot of support so this might be cooler than D D onslaught we'll have to see i would love to play test it yeah absolutely that'd be a fun time check out when uh when it, as we get more information about it. Indeed. Well, that is all of the news items for today. Uh, we'll do a little, I'll, I'll vamp a little bit while Sam looks through the TikTok comments. We record this podcast live every other week on TikTok. We've lately been doing it on Tuesday afternoons, Eastern Standard Time, around like 12 30, 1 o'clock, something like that. You can catch this podcast on YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, all of the podcast services around the globe. You can follow us on TikTok, subscribe to us on YouTube. We got some uh, a lot of free homebrew on Drive RPG. We have not been making anything this year because uh, the the new homebrew rules scare us. <laughs> and the OGL and Creative Commons. Though I have an idea for a really fun like Innistrad dark vampire werewolf vibe little like three session campaign thing that I would like to do. But we'll see. That's going to be a lot of work. I probably won't be this year. Probably won't. We'll have to see. We'll see. I would love to develop it. Uh, God, am I missing anything? The Discord server. Uh, we also do Match the Gathering live streams every Monday night at 9 p.m. on uh, TikTok, where we play some Commander. We've been doing some Jump Start, where we open the packs, shuffle them together, and play, which has been really fun. We, yeah. we enjoy that very much. Uh, and we're also going to be going to Gen Con in August. So please, if you're going to Gen Con, let us know and come hang out and say hi. Yeah. We'll be doing lots of things. We're going to be hanging out with a lot of other TikTokers as well, hopefully. So that'll be fun. Ready to cue some A's? I am. Wait, no. A's and Q's? A, oh. I'd rather cue an A, but I'll A a Q if that's what we got. Well, to start, uh, everybody was, a lot of people were very uh, positive about your weight loss journey. Oh, thank you. Um, all right. Let's see. The Grim 666, favorite modern deck. Unfortunately, we don't play modern. Don't. We don't. Uh, I prefer, I prefer decks that allow everyone to play the game and not win on turn two or three or lose. That's fair. Yeah. Um, let's see. Thunk Whistle, Thunk, Thunk Whistle the Gnome. Asking our opinions on the, uh, online, on the virtual tabletop. The virtual tabletop. Oh, we've talked about the 1D&D, uh, VTT several times. Um, the, with the last, uh, D&D Direct, which was mostly a waste of time, the one of the few highlights was showing off more in detail the VTT, which looks really, really cool. I'm glad that they're releasing it on Steam. I'm glad that it's probably coming to consoles. I would love if they had some VR headset support. Um, I think they could integrate it a lot more. I, like, as we've discussed, it, the integrations that it has with D&D products... Uh, for they talked about uh, like a campaign book where a lot of the major battle maps that are in the book can be replicated are 
will come with codes where you can redeem in the VTT so that they can be fully replicated. They'll also come with like new pieces that you can play with to develop your own maps. It seems like it's really, really cool and I would love to try it out. Uh, it's built in Unreal Engine, so it's a great game engine. It's gonna seemingly be on all the consoles and PC and I would love to try it out, but we personally prefer to play in person, generally. Yeah. Uh, JBLH. Thoughts on the new on Daggerheart from Critical Role, their new R T T R P G. Yes, um, they're developing two R P G systems right now. One of them a D six based system for uh, shorter term storytelling games, uh, focused more on narrative and role play. And then they're developing Daggerheart, which is seemingly a D twenty based system. I don't think they specified that, but it's still going to be their own tabletop R P G system for longer run campaigns, presumably. If, D, if uh, Critical Role were to do a campaign four, which I imagine they would, uh, they're going to wait until after their Daggerheart system is out and then use that system instead of D&D and maybe distance themselves from D&D. I don't know if they would do that with the core Critical Role show or if they develop a different show for it. Yeah, it'll be... It, it's, it's one of those things where they've brought so many people in and so many people love them love D&D because of critical role it would be interesting to see how that dynamic would play out if mm-hmm. they switched off um but i mean with all of the uh the the uh tomfoolery oh yeah that has been happening with D&D who knows a lot of people have either a jump ship or you know are are more ready to jump ship now than ever than, they, than ever yeah exactly and it, it they it's clear that critical role has a bit of a tension with them as well based on their official comments about D D, specifically D D beyond during all the ogl fiasco they have a partnership with D D beyond a contract to be sponsored by them for the entirety of campaign three so they can't really talk shit about them and it's clear that they are, have some ndas and stuff where they can't talk about this kind of controversy um I would be very surprised. I'd be both very surprised and not surprised at all if the core critical role offering moved over to Daggerheart. Mm-hmm. Though they've been including a lot of guests more recently. That's true. Abria Iyengar, Brennan Lee Mulligan, uh, so many people that want to be involved in critical role. I would not be entirely surprised. C- currently, spoilers for Campaign 3, currently, the core cast and party are split. And there's, they're following one group right now uh, with Laura, Travis, Ashley, and Sam. And then they also brought in Abria Iyengar and... Oh, why am I forgetting his name? His character's Frida. He's awesome. Love him. And they're doing their own thing on Wildmount right now. And then uh, Laura, Liam, and Talison, presumably with some other guests, are eventually going to do their half of what's happening with them. Um, would they split the cast and... You guys play D anD D, and you guys play Daggerheart. Would they keep Critical Role proper as it is with D anD D, and do like a weekly alternating with another campaign run by Abria, run by Brennan, run by someone else uh, in Daggerheart? Would they do? Would Matt do both? Would they alternate week to week? Would they just add multiple shows? I don't know. It's clear they're developing their own system because they want their own system and use their own system for their own show, Mm -hmm. which I think is totally fine. And they're developing two systems for different purposes. So are they going to run? Are they going to have a lot more calamity style short run things with their D6 based system that are really narrative heavy? And like there's a lot of what ifs and it's clear they're juggling a lot of balls right now. Just just grabbing them, throwing them around, slapping around a little bit, juggling them. Sure. Tossing them around. So we'll we'll see how they handle all these balls. All right. Um, let's see. Going back to uh, why the, why Wizards didn't split up um, the two, af- uh, at make an actual March of the Machines and an actual Aftermath set, uh, I was pointing out that would make too much sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Broomball guy, dude, the Broomball dude, for high-level D&D parties, like 16 and above, what plants do you like to use in a plant-only encounter? Plants. Oh, man. You know what I feel in my heart of hearts, in my deepest soul, is that when you're running a game that high level, don't rely on the books. Not at all. No. I, w- I was going to say make make an environment that can be manipulated by someone mm-hmm. and just have the plants be like lair actions. Or uh, do 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 yourself a little shop of horrors. 
yeah. sequence. Yeah. Feed me Seymour. Um, I'm Feed me. New to D&D. I'm new, uh, Eddie. I thought you, pause. I thought you said nudity in D&D for a nudity second. Nudity in D&D. How do you feel about nudity? Should you come to the table dressed? Eh, depends. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, we play D&D our own house. Anyway, that was the not question. Eddie uh, says, I'm new to D&D and trying to find people to play with. Where can I find them? They asked specifically in the LA area, but I think that we can answer for the general. For anywhere. Uh, the Dungeon Bros Discord server. <laughs> Uh, very dead. People are people occasionally put stuff in the looking for game channel, but it doesn't seem like we have a lot of people replying, which sucks. Do that, but you can also check out Reddit. There's a lot of looking for game websites. You can also pay to be in like really well run uh, professional D and D games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can pay for a seat at the table. Uh, pay every session in like like ten to fifty dollars, depending on the size, the scope, the all this stuff. I can't remember the website of it. You can just look up professional dungeon master, professional D and D, and you can find resources for that if you're willing to pay for it. You can also go to your local game shops to play in person with people. They usually have. Uh, you can look for adventures, league games, and all that, which are like official Wizards of the Coast sponsored things that are a bit more standardized. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of options, and then, and thankfully, with uh, COVID, a lot of a lot of companies developed ways to play online and at a distance. Mm-hmm. Um, so many great virtual tabletops. We end up, you know, doing games with friends who may only live an hour away, so it's not terrible. Like I go up and play currently with my friends, but back then, you know, uh, I played on Discord, played on mm-hmm. on other uh video apps so uh your friend darren our friend darren yeah i met him uh he dm'd uh, descent into avernus for That's us right. for one session for one session Just one little session we he was using roll 20 i believe we were using roll 20 yeah, it was totally fine um the cardinal sin pointed out that i have my and that i am not wearing shoes or socks so I got the dogs. You out got for you free. got the dog. You got the dogs out for free on the stream. Yo, I, we're we're at home right now. We are. I got no, no reason to wear shoes. No I got the blue. Shoes. I got the blue socky doos on. I like these. They're very they're very comfortable wool socks. Highly recommend. Um. Yeah. That about it. That's about it. That's about it. Fair there's, enough. There's some conversation going on today, uh, between some different people in the chat, and it was very very nice to see them talking about other you know D and D books. Yeah. And some things that are also happening in D and D community and the mtg community absolutely uh well if that is if that's all we got to say i feel like we there was a lot of news and we blew through it pretty quick there's a lot of news but it was all around the same topics yeah that's true that's true good for us go team go team well if uh if you want to hang out with us further you can always join our discord server link in the link tree of all of the bios of our social media we have an instagram account as well sam's been making a lot of great instagram reels about learning to play DD, learning to play match the gathering you can also find those on our youtube where you can subscribe where we're going to do some more longer form things we're we're hunkering down we're we're it's time it's time it's time to start churning out our shit and we're ready for it our content creation water broke yeah yep oh, oh. <laughs> wow uh, we getting comfy. I just I don't know how to react to it. <laughs> I'm not uncomfortable. I just am dumbfounded. Honestly, uh, we we have some ideas and some purchases to make to try and level up our Match the Gathering streams. Uh, get a top down camera. Maybe get a little bit of OBS like scene switching action in our TikTok TikTok lives. You can watch us play Match the Gathering live every Monday on TikTok at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we usually play some Jump Start. Uh, cracks and packs shuffle them together we have commander decks we play some historic brawl which is two player commander 25 starting life all that kind of stuff uh, you can listen to the podcast subscribe to the podcast on youtube apple google spotify podcast services round the globe uh and again we would like to thank uh the first ever sponsor of the dungeon bros podcast uh in immeasurable pain never ending immeasurable pain pills uh check them out you can get them wherever immeasurable pain pills are 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 sold which they're uh, very cheap some people get a lot of people get them for free yeah just right out of bed every morning out delivered to you 
d- delivered into your into your body into your system immediately upon waking. Yep. So check them out for sponsor of the Dungeon Bros podcast. Also, we forgot to mention this at the top. We did a bonus episode of the podcast last week with our uh, with our good friends at Found Familiar Dice. Uh, Jason he talked about dice making and resin and all that kind of stuff. How to get into dice making? His inspiration. Got a lot of wonderful products. You can check them out on foundfamiliardice.com as well as on Instagram. Uh, let him know that we sent you. Cause it won't help you in any way, but it's nice. It won't. It was it, nicely. It won't. He might, you know, he might, he might send you one of the deliciously fucked up failed castings that apparently exist. Yeah. Just say, just say the dungeon bros sent you. Yeah. Yeah. He sent, he sent us dice in the past and he said we're flawed in some way. And we have still failed to figure out what the flaw was in them. And we've had them for like over a year at this point. And they're beautiful. They're beautiful, they're wonderful, sharp edged dice. We he, absolutely love a, them. He is a craftsman of, of, immeasurable quality quality indeed indeed you uh next episode of the podcast we will definitely be talking about the actual release of the one D playtest with the warriors and the and the sorcerer and the warlock and the wizard and all of that we'll go into detail and that might be a bonus episode we're gonna see if we can get one of our one of our content creator buddies i don't want to name them just because we don't know if things are gonna work out we would love to actually play test one D as well uh which we would like to do in person with our friends and you know maybe hit up the discord server and see if there's anyone that wants to fuck around fuck around possibly find out yeah possibly find out but in the meantime thanks for watching and uh peace